At this point, we know quite a bit about the nature of electrons in atoms, specifically the quantum mechanical description of how electrons occupy atomic orbitals and the energies and shapes of those atomic orbitals, which show the probability distribution of the electron over space. Remember, inside those shells of the atomic orbitals, we have a high probability of finding the electron within the atom. In this series of videos, I want to transition to talking about chemical bonding and molecular structure, which will expand our idea of the notion of an orbital and quantum chemistry, while at the same time bringing in some other more fundamental concepts. In this first video of the series, I want to give a quick introduction to the nature of the chemical bond. The idea that molecules are made of atoms is part of the atomic molecular theory, and of course it's a fundamental idea that's central to chemistry. But what is it exactly that holds together the atoms within a molecule? What's called a chemical bond. Whatever that means is basically the definition of a chemical bond. There have been as many bonding theories over the years as there have been chemists, is one expression I've heard. So the notion of a chemical bond is, is actually constantly undergoing marginal revisions. But for what we'll talk about here, we'll gain a pretty good appreciation for the most common types of bonds that we see. Atoms can either transfer or share electrons in order to bond with one another, or a combination of the two. The transfer of electrons is generally associated with ionic bonding. And when we say transfer, we mean that a neutral atom gives one or more electrons to another neutral atom to form a pair of ions, a pair of charged particles, and that's where the term ionic comes from. When atoms share electrons, that is, they don't completely transfer, atom A does not completely transfer electrons to atom B, but they share, say, a pair of electrons, that's known as a covalent bond. There's a somewhat murky line between sharing and transfer, right? And so we think of chemical bonding along a continuum. A bond might be more or less ionic. A bond might be mostly covalent with a little bit of what's called ionic character. We can find bonds in a variety of molecules that sit at a variety of places along this continuum. For now, we're going to focus on bonds between atoms that are very clearly either covalent or ionic. And when it comes to ionic bonding, the atoms that participate in ionic bonding are on the far left and on the far right of the periodic table. And so on the far left, we have the metals. And on the far right, we have the nonmetals. And when a nonmetal gets together with a metal, we end up with an ionic bond. So like we just mentioned, when electron transfer takes place, when an atom gives up or takes in electrons, cations and anions form. And the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions is what holds them together, and it's what's known as an ionic bond. How does ionic bond strength depend on distance and charges? So, in other words, how strong is an ionic bond given, say, the radii of the ions involved and their corresponding charges? Well, actually, we already know the answer to this question, right? Coulomb's law. In Coulomb's law, Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the two ions involved, and R is the distance between them. And for an ionic compound, let's take the example of one of the most famous ionic compounds, NaCl, this distance R between the charges we think of as the combined radii of the two ions. And so sodium plus has some radius, which I can represent with a length in blue. Let's call that R1. And Cl minus has some radius, which is going to be larger because it's an anion. Let's call that R2. For the purposes of Coulomb's law, the R, the distance between the charges, is the sum of these two radii, R1 plus R2. Just briefly then, this is some motivation to understand trends in ionic radius, right? Because if we can appreciate trends in ionic radius, we can then reason about ionic bond energies of, say, one ionic compound versus another ionic compound. So NaCl versus KCl, or NaCl versus LiCl, for example. Covalent bonding involves, for the most part, only the nonmetals and hydrogen. So I've highlighted in green here the nonmetals within the main group on the right-hand side of the periodic table, and then this is hydrogen over here. These are the elements that are most commonly involved in covalent bonding, which, remember, involves electron sharing, not the transfer of electrons, 
but electron sharing. So what exactly do we mean by sharing? Well, you can think of it like this. Electrons no longer belong to the specific atoms within a covalent molecule. Instead, the electrons belong to the entire molecule. They're kind of free in some sense to roam the entirety of the molecule and all of the atoms are sharing the electrons. Put another way, which we'll bring into more focus a little bit later, electrons in molecules are described by molecular orbitals rather than atomic orbitals. So we can ascribe to the electrons within a molecule a probability distribution over space, which comes down to a wave function, psi, right? And these molecular orbitals have all those same fundamental properties of atomic orbitals and allow us to draw some of the same conclusions about energy and where electrons are likely to be and, and what have you. And in some cases, we can even see covalent bonds in the form of the shapes of molecular orbitals. So for example, a molecular orbital that has large density between two atoms A and B is referred to as a bonding orbital because in some sense, the electrons that are in this molecular orbital are the electrons that are in the bond between A and B. We'll talk about this in more detail in a later video. One question to ask when we're looking at the bond between two atoms in, say, a diatomic molecule, a molecule defined by two atoms, is what determines the equilibrium or the most stable bonding distance between them. A fairly straightforward way to approach this involves considering repulsion between the electron clouds of the two atoms, which is going to increase the energy as the two atoms get closer to one another, and the attractive forces between the electrons and the nuclei of the two atoms, which is going to decrease the energy as the two atoms approach. What we're plotting on the x-axis here is the distance between the two atoms, and you can see as we move to lower distances, the repulsive forces rise relatively slowly, and the attractive forces fall more quickly. What that leads to is a situation where the energy starts to fall and eventually reaches a minimum. After the minimum, the repulsive forces are rising quickly, and so the energy here increases rapidly after the minimum, and the equilibrium bonding distance is defined by this point where the energy is at a minimum. This is known as the Leonard-Jones potential, and you see a picture of Leonard there on the left-hand side of the slide. So the bond length for a bond, or what you might hear referred to as the equilibrium bond length, is at a minimum in this energy versus R curve, and this is a very general shape for energy versus R, so it's worth keeping in mind. 